ladies and gentlemen, and uh, my name is Paolo von Schirach. I am privileged to serve as a president of the Global Policy Institute, an independent think tank here in Washington, D.C., and as chair of political science and international relations at Bay Atlantic University. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this event, which is meant to uh, commemorate uh, the unfortunate uh, circumstances of the uh, failed, the attempted and failed coup d'etat back in 2016 in Turkey. And uh, there's been, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, how can I say, discussion, uh, not only what happened in Turkey then, but also on the ripple effects of those events in the bilateral US-Turkey uh, relationship. And this is gonna be a part of our conversation today. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker, and that is His Excellency, Mr. Uh, Serdar Kilic, the uh, Turkish ambassador to the United States of America, and a good friend of uh, Bay Atlantic University and the Global Policy Institute, I should say. Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is thank yours. you, Paul. Thank you, Paolo. First of all, I should like to thank uh, Global Post Institute, the Atlantic University, to you personally, of course, uh, not only as a good friend, but as an able uh, leader, decision shaper in Washington, D.C., that is uh, cognizant of all the developments pertaining to Turkish American relations and the realities in Turkey. I would like to thank you in that regard. I would like to thank Sina Manam as well for her contributions uh, to today's event. I would like to welcome Robert Amsterdam and, and uh, Ergin uh, Paşam. Hoş geldiniz, safalar getirdiniz. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, maybe I should start by uh, setting the record straight as far as what happened on the 15th of July in Turkey and how we came to that point. On the 15th of July, four years ago, exactly on this day, a group of rogue army officers, by making use of the weapons given to them by the Turkish army and by the Turkish nation, took to the streets. They attacked uh, state uh, institutions, state structures, and they tried to overthrow the democratically elected government in Turkey and to get control of the state, the Turkish state, and disrupt the Turkish democracy. But thank God, the Turkish people, upon the call of President Erdogan, take to the streets, took to the streets, and, and uh, defended their democracy, their country, future of their country, and also their democratically elected leaders. This is uh, maybe the main difference uh, between the previous coup attempts in Turkey, successful or not, and the 15th of July. Let, let me highlight uh, a couple of distinctions in that regard between 15th of July and the previous coup attempts in Turkey. The previous coup attempts were conducted uh, in the chain of command with the participation of all segments of the uh, Turkish armed forces. On the 15th of July, the Turkish armed forces or the elements that have participated in the, in the terrorist coup attempt were under the control of civilians. Civilians uh, defined as imams in the Fethullah Gülen terrorist organization. If you take a look at the persons that were apprehended at the uh, headquarters of the coup plotters on the 15th of July, namely the Akıncı uh, Air Base, there were Adil Öksüz. He was uh, the, the imam of the armed forces. Kemal Batmaz, he was the imam of the Turkish Air Forces. Hakan Çiçek, he was the imam of the uh, land army and uh, land forces. Harun Biniş, he was the imam of uh, the Navy. And Nurettin Oruç, he was the imam of gendarmerie. All of them were apprehended at the uh, Air Base. And the coup plotters, during that night, there are uh, video shootage, shoot, uh, footages in that regard, they were saluting and they were taking direct instructions from those civilians. So that was one of the uh, distinctions in that regard. Second, uh, uh, first time Turkish army uh, officers or soldiers that have participated in uh, the coup attempt opened fire on civilians. And on the 15th of July, the civilians did not have weapons in their hands. They just had Turkish flags, and they were trying to convince the uh, rogue officers that have participated in the, in the coup attempt that what they were doing was wrong. 
They were doing harm to the country. They were doing harm to the future of the country. And they were killed, 251 of them. Over 2,000 of uh, Turkish citizens that took uh, to the streets that night were wounded, some of them very seriously, and they are going to be crippled uh, throughout their life because of the uh, wounds, that they, wounds they, uh, that they were subjected to uh, during that time. And maybe uh, there is another important element that we should not lose sight of. 15th of July was not the first attempt of the terrorist organization, Fethullah Gülen terrorist organization, to overthrow or try to overthrow the Turkish government and to control the Turkish state. First, in 2013, between May and August, they tried a social uh, coup, so to speak, if you would like to define like that. They uh, initiated uh, social unrest on the streets and hoped that it will uh, ultimately result in the uh, disruption of the Turkish uh, system and that the Turkish government will be overthrown. But uh, during the municipal elections three months later, the Turkish people gave their response uh, to the initiative taken in that regard. Second, there was an attempt by making use of a uh, legal uh, system in Turkey, also with the assistance of the security forces. On the 17th and 25th of uh, December, with forged documents, fabricated evidences, they tried to uh, overthrow the Turkish government as well. Of course, at the end of the day, as I uh, mentioned before, they, the response was, give, was given by the Turkish people uh, at the municipal elections uh, conducted in 2014 in March. The military coup attempt on the 15th of July was the third attempt in that regard to overthrow the Turkish government and to get control of the state structures. Who participated in the, in the, in the coup attempt in that regard? The rogue officers in the Turkish army. Today, we have one of the most respected uh, commanders of the Turkish army with us, General uh, Aigen Saigun. He is, he is uh, one of the officers uh, that I had the pleasure of working with, participating in meetings, and uh, I always admired the way he defended Turkey's uh, rights and, and Turkey's uh, expectations uh, at, the, at the international uh, meetings, and also he suffered a lot. Why? Because he was loyal to the Turkish state, he was loyal to the Turkish government, and he was loyal to the Turkish flag. All of those officers that uh, adopted a similar stance in the Turkish army uh, somehow uh, were subjected to uh, legal proceedings and, and they were uh, unfortunately taken out of the army. And they were replaced by the rogue army officers that have participated in the 15th of July coup attempt. I am sure uh, General Saigon will uh, give ample information in that regard because he personally uh, suffered at the hands of the, 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 the judges and prosecutors that have their loyalty passed out upon to uh, the person living in Pennsylvania. Having said all these uh, on the 15th of July, I should like to uh, highlight what we expect from the US government because since uh, the, 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 the uh, leader of that uh, terrorist organization is residing in the United States, of course, the Turkish people, not only the Turkish government, have high expectations from the United States in that regard. Actually, we expect the United States to abide by the, the rules and regulations letter and split of the agreement that we have signed with the United States on the, uh, on, in, in 1979 on the extradition of uh, those kind of persons. And we have... Uh, delivered to U.S. authorities, submitted to U.S. authorities, 85 boxes of documents and evidence. That has substantiated the basis or, or the role of uh, Fethullah Gülen and his organization uh, on the 15th of July terrorist coup attempt in Turkey. But they are still working on those documents and unfortunately, so far, we did not receive the positive response from the, or the response that we have expected from the U.S. authorities. But let alone what he has done in Turkey prior to 15th of July, during the 15th of July, and maybe still. But there are also things that he is doing in the United States that the U.S. authorities should be more concerned. The Fethullah Gülen terrorist organization is running 180, roughly, I mean around 180 charter schools in the United States. And he, he is collecting on an annual basis 800, 850 million U.S. dollars from the U.S. taxpayers' money. So actually, as a matter of fact, 
I am sorry uh, to put it that way, but the American people, American taxpayers, unwillingly financed uh, the military coup in Turkey on the 15th of July. And they are still financing the terrorist organization unwillingly. They don't know that they are supporting a terrorist organization. But we have given ample information, as I told you, to the US authorities in that regard to act upon. And I hope that uh, sooner than later, the US authorities are going to come to terms and uh, they are going to take action uh, as far as his activities on the 15th of July and before in Turkey, but also as far as his activities in the United States are concerned, tax evasion, H-1B visa uh, irregularities, bringing teachers to uh, charter schools from United States, and uh, money laundering and illegal transfer of funds from Turkey to the schools in the United States. We have given ample information in that regard as well to the US authorities. So I hope that uh, the US authorities are going to take the necessary action and at least we are going to clear an important uh, item from our bilateral agenda. Thank you very much, Tina Manum. I will, I will uh, try to stop here and I will let General Saigon and, uh, and Robert Amsterdam uh, to share their uh, views with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. And you uh, created a framework for us to discuss, to dig into uh, with the help of our two distinguished participants. Uh, I would like to welcome you all as the president of Bay Atlantic University. And I would like to continue from where you ended actually. Uh, uh, we have two distinguished participants. Um, Pasham, um, the retired general who served in the Turkish military for a long time, who served uh, under Turkish military at various countries, who has an international experience as well, and who knows the relationships between uh, Turkey and America as two strong NATO allies, uh, and also Mr. Amsterdam, uh, who have been uh, working on Gulen case uh, in the US uh, for the Turkish government, and also published a book on Gulen movements uh, that uh, Mr. Ambassador summarized, but I would like uh, Mr. Amsterdam uh, to dig into that issue, the charter school issue in the U.S. in a bit. Uh, so those two distinguished panelists and the detailed resumes, a detailed background of them uh, could be found in the email invitation. So using the time effectively, I will not go into detail, but I would like to, we have many international participants, as you can see, um, you know, we have around 46 attendees now, and many of them may not know who Gulen is. Uh, some, uh, I checked, you know, the names, maybe some uh, lived in Turkey for some time, they are familiar with who Fethullah Gulen and this, you know, the story of this movement that started as a religious movement, but then it turned out to be an international terrorist organization. So I would like to first ask uh, Pasham, uh, General Ergin Saigon, to tell us about his experience. I know this is not a very pleasant one. Um, I mean, you've had some unpleasant uh, time experience uh, with this terrorist organization being framed by them and then being even convicted to, as far as I remember, an 18 year of uh, prison time. Uh, but due to your health issues, you did not uh, serve. Uh, but right after that, you know, this coup attempt uh, happened. And now uh, we know how you were framed by them. But for the international audience, this doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, Mr. Ambassador said at the beginning on July the 15th, how a group of um, people in the military to try to, to uh, take over the control. But how did we come to that point as the Turkish military? Could you please give an idea uh, about what happened in the Turkish military so that the audience, our international audience, could make a better sense uh, of our experience? Thank you very much, first, for including me in this uh, webinar. And I would like to especially thank to his Excellency, Turkish Ambassador, for his very kind words. Um, I think what happened in Turkey is uh, a long story, but how we came to what happened to Turkey is another issue. Now, as 
Mr. Ambassador said, Fethullah Gülen is living in this country for 11 years and he's been uh, he's been granted uh, residence status for health his uh, for health treatment medical treatment uh, but of course this is not quite true because now he runs um, a huge empire of uh, trade uh, commercial issues and magazines and corporations, schools all around the world. He he's runs about 600 schools, as far as I know. Um, only, as the ambassador said, in the United States is 180. Um, why? What is his status? Why he has such a privileged status in the United States? For instance, he supports uh, congressional candidates uh, like Hillary Clinton, their election campaigns, he donates money, quite a lot of money. We are talking about millions of dollars. How he earns this money and how much tax does he pay in the United States? Um, to make a long story short, why is he protected? This is, I think, an important question. Why the US government allowed him to make what he did in Turkey. Uh, I think it was Senator Welch uh, just two days after the uh, 15th of attempted coup, 15th of July, he said, uh, Gülen is a victim of US policies. Now this is a very ambitious uh, sentence. And in fact, I think that is what happened. Now, uh, He's still doing what he's doing, but maybe not as um, as good as he was maybe five, ten years, five years ago. Um, but uh, he, it is not finished. It is he, he will still continue to do uh, to complete his mission. Now, what is his mission in the United States? Of course, is unknown to me. But I think if if I can speak for another three, four minutes. I would like to say that religion has always been a very practical tool in US foreign policy. Um, this, I think, started as far as I know in 1994-95 with the emergence of moderate Islam. The idea was if you increase moderate Islam, you will reduce uh, fanatic Islam or fundamentalist Islam. Well, it didn't work out that way, but uh, in the 90s, 1990s, there was a approach from the US administration to what they thought was moderate Islam uh, organizations. The one I remember is uh, Supreme Islamic Council of America, uh, run by uh, Rabbani Hakkai. We know him as Sheikh Nazim Kubrisi and many others. Um, of course, there are also news that in the Central Asian, in some of his schools in Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan, 130 CIA uh, officers were working. Now, some say this is not true, but I think Fethullah Gülen was a useful tool also to infiltrate into uh, the Central Asian republics. Now. What is what we should? What is the situation now? Of course, as the ambassador said, I think uh, there is a problem with his extradition to Turkey. Um, the U.S. authorities say that he has won a legal case, so legally he has some rights to stay in the United States. But I think President uh, Trump put the full stop. I think two years ago when he said his extradition was not uh, on the table or was not considered in that manner. Now, so this, everything started as a religious affair. And I think the US is still making a mistake by considering him as a religious figure, a clerk. He is not. As the ambassador said, he's the leader of a terrorist organization. Um, so I think, the US authorities will now consider the, the events of the 15th of July and uh, think again 
what good would it do for them to keep this man under protection? Now, how I personally was affected from this man, very, very shortly, the Gulenists have a long track record of framing their perceived opponents engaging in judicial tricks because they controlled key positions at the judiciary and the police. They mount targeted operations disguised as legal investigations. When I was the first army commander back in uh, 2009, somebody told me that a four-star general will be arrested. I said, was it me? He said, no, you will be arrested six months after you retire. And they missed the six months margin by just by a couple of days. And they put me in prison, in prison when I was receiving uh, medical treatment in a hospital for serious heart problems. When I was in the prison, I was suffering from heart, lungs, kidney, high blood pressure, diabetics, vertigo, and a couple of others. But in the prison, they put me in a cell where I had to do all my medical requirements by myself, measure my blood sugar, so that decide on how much insulin should I make, and use machines for proper breathing, and various other things. Uh, I, all I wanted was to have a proper medical treatment, which was denied. So I had to go to the European Court of Human Rights. When I was, then I was put in a hospital, but the hospital wrote a report and said, I should be discharged because the longer I stayed in the hospital, there is a problem of uh, my heart problems with uh, infection of the heart valve. The court said no, and that happened exactly what the hospital said. And I have to take a third heart operation with a very slim chance of surviving, but fortunately I did. And so this, I'm not the only one, there are many others because the, the death toll during all these trials and, and the prison term is about 13 or 14 people. They lost their wives in, in prison or in uh, while serving outside. Not only the, the officers themselves, but also their families. There were casualties from the family itself. So, uh, if, if we go back to, as, as you said, the fake trials uh, with fake evidence, manufactured uh, documents, all of us were received heavy sentence. I was uh, sentenced to 18 years, but then uh, we were tried again and the court decided that uh, it was fake or manufactured uh, documents. So we were, uh, now we have, we are set free. Um, why it happened? Of course, this is this is not a, something which happened uh, instantly. It, it took years to build up. Uh, I would like to, if I can find it very very quickly. You must move in the arteries of the system without anyone noticing your existence until you reach all the power sentence and anything you do must seem to be legal. This is the instruction he gave to all his followers and all these instructions were, uh, this is exactly what they did. So I think this, uh, at this moment is all I have to say without taking too much of your time, but, uh, if things come to, again, to the using Islam on this issue, I might have a few other words to say. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for sharing, you know, uh, you know, some of those unpleasant moments for you. I'm sorry that, you know, I yeah. have to ask that question to you, but it really would create a frame for the international audience because that's really difficult for them to understand. As you said, nothing has happened instantly. Yeah. It took 
years for them to create that system to go into the arteries of the judiciary of the police forces of the military and you know they in a way framed many of our distinguished generals or other military officers like you yourself so that they can place their own uh, you know military people and uh, four years ago, on July the 15th, those were the ones that attempted this uh, coup. Uh, and now uh, I would like to switch to Mr. Amsterdam. So, um, uh, General uh, Saigun uh, summarized what happened in Turkey and how this terrorist organization works, what their mentality is and how they operate. But how about the U.S.? Because um, for me, as the president of an American university, but as a Turkish citizen uh, who grew up in Turkey uh, in a secular family and who have, you know, always uh, thought about this group long time ago, you know, you know, these are religious people and who are trying to misguide people and we should keep ourselves away from these people. Um, but why is it so difficult for the Americans to understand this point of view? Uh, because we've experienced in Turkey that they all start their operations using education as a tool. And this is how they operate in the US, exactly the same way that they are starting schools and then they are, um, you know, uh, creating good connections with the local uh, governments uh, to affect people and to take them near them and even, you know, uh, supporting political figures uh, to gain more political power. How do they operate in the US? You wrote a book on this. That's why I'm asking this question to you. How do they operate? And, you know, how can they still keep their schools open uh, despite all the FBI investigations? Could you please, you know, uh, share uh, some uh, statements so that the audience can also understand what's going on in the U.S. I think we lost uh, Mr. Amsterdam right about. He was starting to answer. We lost him. And let's wait for him to reconnect. If he does not reconnect, you know, in a few seconds, then I will uh, ask my second question uh, to General Saigon. Okay, so let's continue with you, General Saigon. I think he will be uh, joining us again, Mr. Amsterdam. You said that you wanted to make further comments about how they use religion. Would you like to continue from where you left? Yes, thank you very much. Um, as I said, everything, as far as I know, started with the invention of the word moderate Islam. So, there is a lot of benefit in using religion in, uh, in a society which is basically very religious. Um, for instance, I think it was in 1999 that uh, first religious freedom abroad report was published and it still goes on. Now, I think the United States accepted Gulen as one of the moderate Islam organizations. And they gave them it, their support because they think the movement could be managed in the right way to use it to suit America's purposes. Um, as I said, in mid 1990s, uh, in Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan, there were allegations that there are CIA agents in Gulen schools. For instance, the US immigration authorities want to extradite him in 2006, I think it was, but Graham Fuller, the CIA uh, station chief in Kabul, Afghanistan, and 
Norton Avramovich, one of the U.S. ambassadors in Ankara, uh, provided reference for him to, to stay in the United States. So I'm telling all these that uh, he is considered as a religious figure who can help the U.S. Uh, reach out to countries where uh, religion is a major factor, which was wrong, of course, because I, I hope that they understood now that he is he is not the religion religious man that they were hoping he is. Um, so the the fifteenth of July coup attempted and failed coup showed that he will not this organization will not hesitate to take all the risks to change the regime of a country no matter what the cost. This should be a clear warning also to the maybe United States. I'm, I'm not saying he's trying to change the regime in the United States, but um, the, the, in the countries they operate, there is always a danger that they, will, they reach out their hands for uh, further things. Will he be extradited? The Mr. Ambassador said that there is a um, treaty between US and the uh, Turkey about extradition and mutual assistance, but apparently it doesn't work at the moment. Um, religion is getting more and more popular. That for, for instance, there is the issue of Saint Sophia in, in Turkey now, it's open to uh, for prayers. And even the United States says, don't do it. I mean, why why shouldn't we do it? It's it's our it's a place within the boundaries of the state of Turkey. But religion, as I said, has always been um, a key point. One interesting thing here is the US is so much interested in the moderate Islam. But on the other hand, uh, they work hand in hand with the uh, terrorist organizations which use Islam, for instance, Taliban, for instance. The U.S. provided weapons for the Taliban to fight against the Russians in Afghanistan, and then they had to buy them back. Um, Al Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, was operated in one of the Gulf states, and the local CIA man visited to get well soon visit. Um, it was President Trump. He said that. Daesh, Daesh, ISIL, ISIL, whatever their name is, was formed by Barack Obama. Now, these are things on one side you work with for moderate Islam, but on the other hand, you are trying to raise uh, radical Islam. So I think this is a clash of interest between the various agencies in the US system. This is all I have to say at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, you positioned uh, the leader of this terrorist organization, Fethullah, Fethullah Gulen, as someone that has been used by the, you know, several U.S. agencies, including CIA, but, uh, and that is how he uh, can have residency in the U.S. now under protection, and uh, despite Turkey's uh, insistency, uh, the U.S. government does not extradite Gulen. I, I will have a question related with that, but let's, uh, Mr. Amsterdam, I think your internet connection was lost and now you are back with us. Uh, quickly, I'm going to repeat my question. How do they operate in the U.S.? How do they establish all these schools? And despite all those FBI investigations, how can they still, uh, you know, keep their schools? Well, look, we published, as you know, a 750 page book called Empire of Deceit, which laid out dozens of scams and frauds. It is very difficult to understand the reticence of uh, American uh, regulators, local, state and federal uh, to engage directly with the organization. I, I will tell you, as is obvious, there are ongoing FBI investigations. Um, in addition, the, uh, the present situation, the pandemic, has brought out the worst in these schools. Uh, because we've identified so many of them engaged in financial fraud, 
we've been looking at their application under the CARES Act and also under other uh, pandemic relief programs. And uh, like some other schools, not only are they double dipping, but they are uh, engaging in the same type of fraudulent contact in terms of numbers of students, numbers of employees, and we're, we're investigating all of this. Many of the teachers uh, in these schools have been fired. Uh, some of them have come to us and, and have given us statements and are, are working with us. But I think it's important for everyone to understand the Gulen, the Gulen organization and the way it carries on, it's, it's almost unknown in terms of the United States. This mixture of uh, religion and criminal fraud and the political power they seek, this is a very rare combination. You have terrorists who are often after discrete goals, but the Gulen organization, in its attempt to seize power, not only in Turkey, but in Africa, in Europe, in over a hundred countries in which they're engaged, they represent a dramatic, in fact, you could say almost an existential crisis in respect to how they are controlled. Because exactly as the general said, uh, they attempt to mask constantly what their true motives are. They present themselves not as terrorists, but as educators. They run a, a dual state program. In other words, they have uh, individuals in their schools, many of whom are Turkish who have already changed their names to Americanize them, and they attempt to fit in with the local community without ever sharing the fact that money is skimmed to the regional imams. All of the Turkish teachers are tithing 40% of their salaries back. Many of these, these Turkish individuals who have been involved in the largest H-1B visa fraud in the history of the United States are being trafficked. In, literally, the Gulen organizations engaging in human trafficking, and yet, Still, we are having a tremendously difficult time convincing Americans of the danger because, frankly, with their various front organizations, Turquoise, Niagara, et al., they spend a lot of time meeting with and attempting to influence American, local, and regional politicians. Uh, they photobomb the President of the United States. They hire very expensive PR and others to attempt to portray Gulen as a political opponent of the Turkish government. He is not a political opponent. There is no political party in Turkey that would ever support Fethullah Gulen. He does not operate as a politician. He is a liar, he is a thief, and quite honestly, he, in, in fairness to the U.S. government, they virtually said that in court. They tried to deny him his stay in the United States at one point, and they basically said that Petula Gulen is not a world-renowned educator, that he's created his own image and reputation by capturing the academic community and then having his own echo chamber recreate his 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 praise. I mean, it is he is very sophisticated. Uh, the general has spoken, and it's true of their very close relationship to the Clintons, which you can see on YouTube. Um, it is not a rumor. It is, I I believe, certainly from our investigations, very clear that there was a relationship between Gulen and certain organs of the United States government because it was believed that Gulen schools in Central Asia could be penetrated uh, and agents could be placed uh, in situ there. And that relationship helped spawn some of the cover he has. Because I will tell you, the way in which the schools are organized in the United States reflects a sophisticated knowledge of local politics that virtually uh, no foreigner could even attempt to, to understand. So 
interrupt at that point. I guess this is one of the main reasons that Russia uh, closed all their schools and banned, uh, you know, this organization to operate uh, in, you know, the Russian Federation, right? I think they closed all their schools back in 2001 or two, claiming that they were used, these schools were, you know, spy organizations. Well, and, and in fact, it's not just the Russians. Uh, Dexter Pilkins wrote a, a brilliant piece in The New Yorker that, that alluded to a lot of this as well. What I think should, should really be underscored is that academics post-2016 are now understanding this double role of Gulen. There was a, a very um, erudite magazine in, in Europe uh, that came out with a special edition on Gulen just recently, where they identified him not as a religious leader, but as an exemplar of what they call parapolitics, uh, an organization dedicated to seizing power, but unwilling in any way to participate in public debate or dialogue. And it is incredibly important for the United States to seize the initiative, not just, and I'm not just talking about extradition, I'm talking about the involvement of this organization in American politics itself. We talked, we had this, this Russian investigation, but quite frankly, the Gulenists are invading American politics at the local level very effectively. They are also one of the largest organizations that spawns anti-Semitism uh, existing in the United States today. And when that comes out, they pretend they're involved in interfaith dialogue, but the, the people that we've had whistleblow on them have been very consistent about what the true beliefs are of these individuals, particularly those at the top, this circle of disciples that live and work around the compound in Sailorsburg. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Amsterdam. Uh, so these initial questions, uh, with the help of these initial questions, I believe the audience, the participants, do now have a sense of how this organization works, not only in Turkey, but uh, in an international arena, and especially in the US using uh, the schools uh, as their um, you know, coverage, this guys. Uh, but let's come back to the uh, main uh, issue. Uh, the panel discussion, we invited you all to discuss what's going on between the, you know, relationships of Turkey and America. Uh, you know, these two countries are long-time NATO allies, but uh, this coup, failed coup attempt um, somehow uh, has not been recognized uh, by our U.S. allies in the way that uh, Turkey would expect. Uh, I'm sorry, sometimes I'm using, you know, we because, you know, I'm a Turkish citizen and maybe I'm a little bit biased, even though, uh, uh, you know, this is not a um, panel discussion where we have some biased opinions, but uh, forgive me when I use the term we sometimes. Uh, but uh, let's discuss what's going on between the relationships of the two countries uh, with this framework of how Gulen worked and maybe how he caused a tension between these two longtime uh, friends, NATO allies. Uh, first, let me ask to uh, uh, General Saigon, um, you know, uh, right now, Washington and Ankara relations, despite a relatively warm personal rapport between the two presidents, they are not good. Beyond the bitterness created by the lack of support for the Turkish government after this attempted coup. There are other issues complicating the relationships and many of them are military related. Uh, from US support to the Kurds in Syria to the Turkish purchase of the uh, S-400s and now support by the Washington of the Greece, Cyprus, Israel coalition in the Eastern Mediterranean that Ankara views as exclusionary and biased. So many things, but many of these uh, issues are uh, actually caused uh, by this tension uh, created uh, by Gulen. I mean, I mean, recognizing him as the leader of a terrorist organization or not and extraditing him 
uh, to Turkey or not. As a retired general who served uh, in several countries like Brussels, Korea, and somehow someone who experienced these strong ties between Turkey and America as NATO allies, what do you think could be done to ease these tensions and create a more relaxed relationship atmosphere between these two long-time NATO allies? Thank you very much. Uh, the issue is very complex. It's, there are many, many issues which uh, be, have built up over the past years. Now, there's a tendency in the United States to use pressure, political pressure, even threats to achieve its uh, political objectives. Do this, otherwise I will do this sort of thing. Now, it is we call arm twisting or threatening. Um, this is what the, a main issue for not reaching to an agreement. There are certain issues which the United States cannot back, move backwards. Um, in order to reach an agreement, you, you must sit down at the table and discuss things, but this is not the case. For instance, the, I will not go all the way back, but we have some very bitter memories, like in 1964, when we received um, a letter from the United States to direct it to the Prime Minister of Turkey, saying that you cannot use US weapons to intervene in Cyprus. They were given to you for NATO purposes. Exactly the same thing happened almost 50 years later. Um, for instance, in Syria, in northern Iraq, uh, YPG and PYD, they are terrorists. But US says, no, this is our ground troops. And they are not terrorists. And uh, they are supplying, the US is supplying these uh, terrorists with thousands of trucks, load of ammunition, uh, sophisticated weapons. There are issues, for instance, now Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, stop searching for uh, oil or gas. And, or there is an issue now of uh, Libya. So all of these uh, conflicting interests, unfortunately, do not allow Turkey and US sit at a negotiating table. Now, to be a little bit maybe biased, as you said myself, uh, the United States doesn't want a strong Turkey in this region because the US has considers itself uh, having responsibilities towards the Greeks, the Armenians, the Kurds, the Jews, OIV. So um, a regional power as Turkey, as a regional power, uh, will not be happy with, with what is going on around it. So the United States, I think, wants to control Turkey. Turkey can be a regional power if it follows a line with the uh, US policies. Otherwise, this clash will continue. This is all, I think, if, if it is enough. I can go on, but I think this is enough. I think that's enough for the time being, because yeah. I have some questions from the audience as well, but thank you very much. Uh, so the same, the similar question that I have for Mr. Amsterdam, um, uh, General Saigon um, shared his uh, views uh, considering the military relationship between the two countries and you as an international lawyer, um, why do you think Washington um, somehow fails to understand the seriousness of these dramatic events? And why is it that the US government, despite the evidence presented by Ankara, is not allowing the extradition of Gulen? And do you see any window uh, that it could happen? This is actually one of the questions asked by uh, one of our participants, Mary. Uh, do you think that's going to happen anytime soon? 
Look, firstly, as I've said for many years, I won't comment on timing uh, in respect to extradition. This is a matter that is a state to state matter and I'm not gonna impose my views. In respect to the Gulen organization itself and stopping their theft of American taxpayer money, I believe that is starting. I think we are starting to see an impact. I think uh, the expansion of some of these schools now has been stopped, not all of them, but some of them, thankfully. And that will continue as more information is put out and more individuals realize as well that the Gulen schools in the United States target the least fortunate. They target the black and Hispanic poor and they, uh, they, they extract massive amounts of uh, Title VII money that is not used uh, for their benefit often. And uh, what's happened with special needs children throughout the United States in these schools is, is frankly horrific. On the broader issues of Turkey and the United States, um, number one, I think, I think we all need to understand that um, the United States State Department right now is, is operating in a way that is different than it has operated in prior administrations. A lot more foreign policy is being dealt with uh, uh, in the White House as opposed to at state. And I believe the future for the Turkish-American relationship is actually quite positive. Uh, Turkey has uh, a tremendous amount of regional weight uh, that needs to be addressed uh, properly by the United States, especially if the United States continues to um, engage in more of its isolationist impulse and, and remove itself from the Middle East and remove itself from many of the territories in which uh, Turkey is heavily engaged. And I think one of the things Americans don't realize is how much American credibility has been lost in the Mideast as a whole. Uh, not just putting this on uh, President Trump, but putting it on President Obama in terms of how Syria was handled. Turkey took in four million refugees that would have been left to rot were it not for the incredible generosity <laughs> of the Turkish people. And yet, rather than, than uh, having that massive uh, step being applauded, uh, Turkey continues to find itself in problems with the EU and in problems with the United States. But I do sense a changes in the offing. Uh, obviously, these are, you know, this touches on issues uh, like the Russian missile purchase or whatnot that I'm not going to speak about. But the, the fact of the matter is that um, Turkey uh, under President Erdogan has played a very uh, strong hand recently in the Middle East and has taken the kinds of steps that are necessary for the defense of the Turkish homeland. And, and that needs to be understood by the American people. If the United States, God forbid, was in the kind of neighborhood that Turkey was, believe me, there would be a, a necessity for a very different type of foreign policy. Thank you very much, Mr. Amsterdam. And now that we have the privilege of hosting His Excellency Sadar Kuluc, uh, the Turkish ambassador to the US, uh, you know, these last two questions I directed to our distinguished panelists, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, what do you think about uh, the tension between the relationships of the U.S. and Turkey, and how do you think uh, we could have a smoother uh, relationships that we used to have in the past? Sinan, thank you very much. Uh, you used a, a, a good definition of Turkish-American relations. You said we are allies. We are allies since 70 years now. But uh, that cannot be an empty definition. Being ally entails certain responsibilities and certain actions that need to be taken vis-a-vis -vis certain events. There needs to be cooperation, coordination, consult consultation, uh, solidarity, mutual understanding, and most importantly, empathy. Mm -hmm. What happened on the 15th of July was a disgrace in that regard. Unfortunately, 
uh, I should admit that that was the uh, most disappointing day of my life in Washington DC as the Turkish ambassador. I was in this office and sitting on this very desk and I had five telephone conversations with the White House. I told them that uh, there was a developing military coup in Turkey out of the chain of command and that was conducted or uh, tried to be conducted by a group of rogue army officers. And I reminded them that they were criticizing the Turkish democracy. They were claiming that the Turkish democracy was in erosion and that there, there is a uh, tendency of uh, autocracy in Turkey. Mm -hmm. And I told them that. The Turkish democracy that you are criticizing, you have been criticizing, is under a direct terrorist attack now. They are trying to overthrow the Turkish government. And now, this is time for you to take your sides. Side with the democratic forces in Turkey. Side with the Turkish people that are trying to defend the democracy that you are criticizing, you have been criticizing. And what happened? After five telephone conversations, I couldn't be able to achieve a statement, a solid statement in support of the Turkish people defending the Turkish democracy at the cost of their lives. There was just a statement uh, concerning a telephone conversation between Secretary of State Kerry and President Obama. That's all. The day after, there was another statement by Secretary Kerry asking the parties, the parties putting the coup plotters and the Turkish people defending Turkish democracy on an equal footing. That was a big disappointment, I should say. The word of condemnation only came four days after the coup attempt in Turkey. Four days. A month later, President, uh, Vice President uh, Pence visited Turkey and he apologized. And he should have apologized. But that resulted in, unfortunately, a developing distrust on the part of the Turkish people vis-a-vis -vis the United States and the United States approached Turkey. Fethullah Gülen is a po poisoning effect on Turkish American relations. But Fethullah Gülen is not only agenda item that's poisoning the Turkish American relations. Ergün, uh, General Ergun Saygun have, have, have mentioned the US support to the YPGPYD in, in uh, Syria. Unfortunately, you made the same, same mistake that is common in Washington, D.C. You, you mentioned the US support to the Kurds in Syria. This is not supporting the Kurds, it's supporting a terrorist organization, YPG, PYD, PKK in Syria. If it was the support to the Kurds, Turkey is the leading country in that regard. We are hosting 300,000 Kurds that escaped from the atrocities of Daesh and YPG, PYD for that matter to Turkey. And they are still residing in Turkey and they cannot return back to Syria. Why? Because YPG, PYD is not allowing any Kurd to return back to Syria, Syria as long as they do not support the political ideology of YPG, PYD. And S-400, was that the first choice of Turkey to buy S-400? It's a big issue in the U.S. Congress now. We were forced to buy S-400 because we needed urgently air defense systems. As uh, Robert Amsterdam has mentioned, I mean, uh, the, the United States is living in a different neighborhood. If we had neighbors like Canada and Mexico, things would have been much different. But we needed air defense systems and we needed them urgently. But the United States, again, did not treat Turkey as an ally. It treated Turkey as yet another customer that it can make profits. That shouldn't be the way the United States should have acted. So, I mean, if we can somehow leave Congress out of the picture, because the Congress, unfortunately, at least uh, now, are uh, acting under uh, the pressure or uh, the guidance of certain lobby groups and interest groups in the United States. Take a look at the decisions on the so-called Armenian genocide let alone the, the fact that uh, the resolution is adopted. It was adopted on the 29th of October, on the National Day of Turkey. That's a good indication in that. And we should somehow control the prejudice, not only in the Congress, but in the press as well. I will give you a striking example. You remember the Chinese uh, citizen standing in front of the tank columns in, in Tiananmen Square? I will give you the headlines uh, uh, in New York Times in that regard. 30 years after Tiananmen, they say, he has become a global symbol of freedom and defiance, immortalized in photos, television shows, posters, and t-shirts. Why? Because he stood single-handedly in front of a tank wall. He tried to defend the Chinese people, right? One person. 
Turkey has lost 251 of its citizens in defense of Turkish democracy. And what was the headline of New York Times? The Erdogan supporters are sheep and they will follow whatever he says. This was the headline of New York Times. So the people, they answered to the call of the president, they took to the streets, they defended the Turkish democracy that was criticized on a daily basis in the US press, and they were criticized as being a sheep, obeying the orders of President Erdogan. So this is the environment that we are functioning in the United States. I really appreciate what uh, Robert Amsterdam is doing. At the end of the day, I hope his efforts is going to raise the awareness of the Fethullah Gülen terrorist organization in the United States, what they are doing actually to the US systems. If the United States is shying away from taking action against Fethullah Gülen, as far as what he has done in Turkey, at least they have to take concrete action in order to stop his activities that are poisoning the US system, financial, visa, and other uh, systems, education in the United States. So I hope that at the end of the day, people in the United States that are cognizant of the importance of Turkey and that are cognizant of the importance of Turkish-American relations are going to realize that United States needs Turkey as much as Turkey needs United States. And the Turkish-American alliance relationship is as relevant as ever, as important as ever. And supporting Turkish-American relations and supporting Turkey in the long run, the long run is actually supporting the United States strategic interest in the region. You cannot defend uh, United States strategic objectives in the region by depending on a terrorist organization like IPG, PYD. You have an ally over there, an old ally, 70-year-old ally that you can defend, that has a democratic system, and that has the second largest army in the United States. I hope those that are friends of Turkey, that are friends of Turkish-American relations in the future will be more vocal. And I hope that uh, President Trump, he has a very good understanding with President Erdogan, is going to contribute a lot in that regard to the Turkish American relations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. So actually, these tensions, uh, there is a chance that these tensions uh, could be over when the US side uh, at least shows some empathy to how Turkey has suffered uh, and maybe has uh, also recognized uh, you know, the, uh, you know what, what Gulen uh, created in Turkey as a system uh, and what Turkey is expecting actually is a recognition. And this is what I understand uh, as a summary uh, of our panelists and our keynote speaker, His Excellency. Now it's 11, uh, 3 past 11. I don't want to take too much of your time. I would like to, uh, you know, go back to our panelists and ask if they have some final remarks that they would like to share because I believe we've had some questions but uh, both Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Amsterdam and uh, General Saigun answered, I guess, those questions already asked. But if I could have your final remarks and then I'm going to uh, end the, this panel discussion. Mr. Amsterdam, yes. we could start with you. I, I want to... I want to just say, uh, I want to speak personally for a minute. Uh, four years ago, I was in the ambassador's office when uh, we were watching uh, the bridge being closed uh, in Istanbul. Uh, to this day, I, as an American, cannot understand this. Uh, we speak of this lack of empathy. I cannot understand why we are still four years later uh, trying to convince people of Gulen's role. And, and I would refer any of these skeptics to the work of Professor Reynolds in the United States, as well now as dozens of others who have made very clear, as Ambas Ambassador Jeffries did the day of the coup, that the only organization that could do this was the Gulen organization, and that the Gulen organization is an inherently hierarchical organization. None of this could have been done without the direct knowledge of Fatula Gulen. But furthermore, I am going to urge the Turkish government to go to the new UN Committee on Counterterrorism and file a demand 
for other governments who have and hosted uh, organizations such as the Rumi Forum or the Dialogue in London to demonstrate to Turkey what they are doing with respect to the war on terror to control and bring to justice many hundreds if not thousands of Gulenists who have left Turkey, entered these countries under false premises, and attempted to portray Gulen as some form of political opponent as opposed to the type of terrorist organization that they are. I think that's incredibly important. And I want to also state uh, our firm is coming out now shortly with book two of Empire of Deceit, which not only addresses the schools, but addresses their incredibly aggressive political activities in the United States through these sophisticated front organizations and interdisciplinary think tanks, such as the Rumi Forum in Washington, that is used consistently to host thought leaders and engage in this intellectual capture that Gulen has been very effective in doing. Thank you very much for allowing me to attend. Once again, I thank, I'm so privileged to be on the panel with uh, both his, his Excellency and, and General Saigon. So thank you so much for this privilege. Thank you, Mr. Amsterdam. Uh, General Saigon, could I have your final remarks, please? Yes, um, thank you. Very briefly, I would uh, like to say a few words on Turkish-American relations. I will not go into detail, but Last year, a poll made by one of the universities in Istanbul showed that 81.3% of the Turkish population consider the United States as the biggest threat to our country. This is incredible, uh, but that's what it is. Now, this was 35% in 2015 and 60% uh, two years ago. So something is wrong. I, the US is doing something wrong. Um, we are allies, but we need to be friends. If, if, we, if the US wants to be friends with Turkey, then for instance, you, sh you may not, you should not declare us as an adversary or President Trump shouldn't say, I will devastate your economy. Um, it is incredible, but people, there are quite a lot of people in Turkey expecting an attack from the United States. Now, we didn't do this, the US did this. So I think it is time the US authorities should sit down and consider what, what is wrong and what is, what is the main issues between us and the US. Thank you very much. It is a privilege for me to attend this the webinar on, on this panel with and I thank you and all the panelists for their contributions. I was I'm very honored to be with them. Thank you. Thank you very much. That honor is uh, ours to host you. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Paolo von Schirat, uh, the director, uh, the president of GPI and Denis Karatash for helping supporting the Atlantic University to organize this event. I would like to Thank His Excellency and the, uh, all uh, the other distinguished panelists, Mr. Amsterdam and uh, General Saigon, for allocating your time, and all the attendees, all the participants for uh, following us. Um, I think Dennis will be sending an email to you all shortly, sharing the link. So for those who have missed, uh, they still have the chance to listen to our webinar. Uh, I. I think this is the end of it. And have a good day. Uh, look Thank you. To our next event organized by GPI and BAU. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.